Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be having a look at occlusion queries which provide a quick and easy method that's built into OpenGL to find out whether an object we render is visible or whether it's being occluded by some other object in our scene. And we're going to be using occlusion queries this week to test whether the sun is visible in our scene and therefore whether the lens flare effect should be rendered or not. So first I'm going to give you a quick overview of how queries work in OpenGL and then we'll have a look at how we can apply them to our specific situation. Before you can carry out a query you first need to create a query object. You can then start the query and while the query is running anything that you render will be queried. The queries don't actually affect the rendering process in any way so the objects will be rendered as normal but while they're rendering, OpenGL will count how many fragments of the object pass the depth test, so it basically counts how many pixels of the objects are visible and actually get rendered. Once you've finished rendering everything that you want to query, you stop the query, and then you can use the query object to retrieve the result. So we're going to want to use occlusion queries to test whether the sun is visible or not in our scene, and to do that, we'll create a query object and then every frame will render the entire scene first and then we'll start the query and render a single quad in the position and scale of the sun. We'll then stop the query and retrieve the result which will tell us how many pixels of that quad pass the depth test, so how many pixels of the quad are visible. We can then set the brightness of our lens flare effect depending on the percentage of the quad that's visible, so if all the pixels pass the depth test then the lens flare effect will be rendered at normal brightness if only some of the pixels pass the depth test, then it will be rendered at partial brightness, and of course if the quad, and therefore the sun, is totally hidden, no pixels will have passed the depth test, and so the lens flare effect will have a brightness of zero. And of course, we don't actually want a floating square in the sky, so we'll make sure that it gets rendered, but isn't actually shown. Let's now have a look at the specific new OpenGL methods that we're going to be using this week to implement the occlusion queries. Firstly, to create a query object, we need to call glgenQueries, which will create a query and return its ID. Then, when we want to start the query, we'll call glBeginQuery, and that takes in the type of query that we want to carry out, and the ID of the query object that we want to use. There are various types of queries that you can do, but the ones that we care about are glSamplesPast and glAnySamplesPast. When using GL samples passed, the result of the query will be the number of pixels that pass the depth test during the query, and this is the one that we'll be using this week. When using GL any samples passed, OpenGL will simply determine if any pixel passed the depth test, so the result would be true if one or more pixels passed, and false if no pixels at all passed. This is something that you could use if you wanted to implement occlusion culling. To stop the query, once we've finished rendering the thing that we were querying, we'll call glEndQuery, which again takes in the type of query that was being used. To get the result of the query, we have to call glGetQueryObjectI, which takes in the ID of the query object and the name of what we're trying to access, which will be glQueryResult. And that will then return the result to us as an int. Finally, to delete the query object when the application closes, we'll call glDeleteQueries, and that of course takes in the ID of the query. So that all seems pretty simple, but there is unfortunately one slight complication that we need to consider, and that is that our application running on the CPU and the rendering processes going on on the GPU are not synchronized. This means that when our application reaches a rendering call like this, it doesn't wait for the GPU to carry out and finish this command before moving on, our application will simply send off that command to the GPU and continue straight away. And if it comes across more draw calls, it will do the same, it simply sends the command to the GPU and continues. The GPU then queues up these commands as it receives them and carries them out in its own time. This is very good for performance because it means that the CPU and GPU can work in parallel and the GPU will pretty much always have work queued up for it, so it never has to stop and wait for the next command to arrive from the CPU. When it finishes rendering one thing, it can move straight onto the next thing without any delay. This is of course a bit of a problem when our application running on the CPU wants to query something that's happening on the GPU, because it might not have happened yet. 
For example, when we're carrying out our query, rendering the test quad, and then asking for the result, the GPU most likely won't be able to provide that result yet because it hasn't yet got round to rendering the quad, and it might have even not finished rendering all of the scene yet. So before we can get the result of a query, we'll need to check whether the result is available or not, and we can do that by again using the glGetQueryObjectI method, but this time the second parameter will be glQueryResultAvailable, and that will return 1 or 0, indicating if the result is ready or not. So when carrying out the queries, one thing that you could do would be to do the query and then wait for the result in a loop like this, which would get you the results on the application as soon as it's available. However, this isn't exactly ideal because firstly the CPU will obviously be idle for a while as it waits for the GPU to finish processing all the triangles that have been rendered in this frame so far, but also once the GPU does finish all the rendering and it gets the result of the query, it will then be idle for a while itself because it has no more tasks queued up and it will have to wait for the application to send the next command from the CPU to the GPU. And obviously all this waiting around being idle is wasting valuable processing time and decreases performance. But if we don't require the result right away, then we can avoid stalling the GPU and CPU by simply collecting the results a frame or so later when it's available, and that's what we're going to be doing in this tutorial. If you'd like to read more about the problems with querying the GPU and the stalling that it can cause, I've linked a very interesting article in the description of this video, which talks about these issues in more detail. So let's now get into the code, and if you want to code along, you can download the starting code from the description of this video, or you can also download the finished code if you just want to have a look through it, and you'll need to set them up in a project that has the lightweight Java game library jar, the lightweight Java game library utils jar, and also the PNG decoder jar. So the first thing that we're going to do in the code is to just to quickly make sure that the skybox and the sun can't occlude anything, and we're actually going to stop them being written to the depth buffer at all by calling gl depth mask and putting in false before we render and then setting it back to true after we render, and we'll do the same for the sun, and this just makes sure that the sun and the skybox don't occlude the quad uh, which we're going to be rendering and querying. Uh, but it does mean that you must make sure that you render your sun after you render the skybox. So let's now start work on the code that's going to render that quad which we're going to be querying, and we're going to do this in the flare renderer class because there's already quite a lot of code in here for rendering a simple quad. Um, I'm just going to define the width and the height of this test quad, and we can of course tweak this later if we need to. We want to make it about the size of the sun, and uh, to make sure that it's a square, the height is going to be the width multiplied by the aspect ratio of the display, which is the width divided by the height. Let's now prepare the method that's going to actually render this quad, and this method is going to be the method that does the occlusion testing, and it's going to need to take in the screen position of the sun so that we know where to render this quad. And this is basically just going to be like rendering uh, any other flare texture, it's just going to be like rendering a new flare texture, uh, except the depth testing has to be enabled, obviously, because the whole point of this is to find out how many samples pass the depth test. Then we just need to load up the position and scale that we want to render this quad at, just like when we render the other flare textures, uh, so that's going to take in the position of the sun and then the width and height of the quad. And then we can just go ahead and render this because the shader will have already been started and the quad VAO will already be bound. So we're just going to render a quad using triangle strips and there are of course four vertices. So this is going to go in the render method, so the render method now needs to take in the screen position of the sun and we're going to call this method after the prepare method because in the prepare method we start the shader and uh, we also bind the VAO, but if we have a look in the prepare method, there are a couple of things here that we don't want to do, such as enabling additive blending and disabling the depth test, so we want to get rid of those two lines, but we do still need to call those two things before we render the flares, uh, the flare textures, so we need to add them in before that, and then in the flare manager class, we just need to give the render method the coordinates of the sun on the screen, 
So you can now go ahead and run that and you should be able to see some texture rendered in the position of the sun. You can change the size of it if you want and the texture, uh, it could be anything, it will just be the last texture that was bound to texture unit zero um, because we didn't bind any specific texture and of course the texture doesn't actually matter. All we care about is the position and scale of this quad and how much of it passes the depth test. And speaking of which, you can see that there's a bit of a problem here, and that is that the quad is not being occluded by anything. It's actually being rendered in front of everything, and all of the samples are always passing the depth test, uh, which is obviously not what we want. The reason for the quads being rendered in front of everything is because in the flare vertex shader, we set the Z position or the depth to zero and that's obviously going to be rendered in front of everything. So we need to set it as pretty much as close to one as we can. If you set it to one, it will actually go, um, it will actually be out of range, but you need to set it as close to one as possible so that everything in the scene occludes it, as you can see here, except of course for the sun and the skybox, uh, which won't occlude it because we turned off depth writing for them, so they're not in the depth buffer, but everything else in the depth buffer now occludes that quad. So we're now going to get started with actually implementing the occlusion queries and I'm going to create a new class for query and this is just for the sake of the tutorial to have all of the OpenGL methods that are to do with queries in the same place for you to look back at at some point if you want to remind yourself of some of them. Uh, so a query obviously has an ID and it also has a type uh, that we're going to take in the type in the constructor and we're also going to generate the query object and to do that, we need to call glgenqueries, and that will return the ID of the query object that's been created. Then to start the query, we have to call glbeginquery. That takes in the type of query, and it also takes in the ID of the query object. Then to finish the query, once we've finished rendering whatever we're querying, we call glendsquery, and that again takes in the type and now to delete the query uh, we have to call gl delete queries and again that takes in the id of the query object then we need to do the methods to do with getting the results from the query object after the query has been carried out so to get the results we call gl get query object i uh, that takes in the ID of the query and also what we want to get, which is the result. So that's GL query result. And the final method that we need is the one to check whether the result is available or not. And to do that, we again have to call the GL get query object I method. And this time uh, it takes in the ID of the query. And now the thing that we want to get is GL query result available and this will return either GL true or GL false and we want to check if it's equal to GL true which is just an int uh, of value 1. And I'm also just going to add a boolean here to check if the query is currently in use. So when the query is started it will start being in use and it will only stop being in use once the result has been got. And of course, we just need one more method here, which will return whether the current query is in use. So we can now use this query object in the flare renderer to carry out a occlusion query. Uh, so we're going to need a query object in the flare renderer class and make sure you import the correct query class here. And we're just going to initialize the query object in the constructor here. And this takes in the the type of query that we want to carry out and as I mentioned earlier that's going to be GL samples passed because we want to know the number of samples that pass the depth test. Then we're going to remember to delete the query in the cleanup methods and then up in the do occlusion test method we want to actually carry out the occlusion test and the first thing we want to do is to check whether the query is already in use so if it isn't in use then we want to carry out a new occlusion query. So that's going to involve rendering the quad. And before we render the quad, we want to start the query. And after we render the quad, we want to end the query. Then to get the results, uh, as I mentioned, we're not going to do this straight away. We're actually going to do this on the next frame. So at the start of the next frame, we're going to check if 
the query result is ready and if it is we can get that result and that result is going to be the number of visible samples or pixels uh, of the quad on the screen and for now we're just going to print out that number so that we can see that it's all working so you should now be able to go ahead and run this uh, your quads might be blinking it might not be just depends on your GPU really and you should be able to see that when the quad isn't being occluded by anything you get quite a large number and when you put it behind a house or something so that it can't be seen at all uh, it should be printing out zero and for now just remember that large number that you get when the quad isn't hidden at all because that should be the total number of samples in the quad and we'll need that to calculate the percentage of the quad that's covered so in the flare renderer class we're now going to calculate the amount of the quad that is visible on the screen and this is going to be a number between 0 and 1 and we're going to uh, calculate this by taking the number of visible samples divided by the total number of samples in the quad and for now we're going to hard code that total number and for me that number is 8100 and we're then going to multiply the coverage by the brightness of the lens flare effect so that when the sun and the quads are hidden the coverage will be zero and therefore the brightness of the lens flare effect will be zero and you can see that that's working here so when the sun is hidden behind something the lens flare effect is now not shown however it would be nice to not have to hard code the total number of samples for the quads here especially as that number will change if the screen size changes so we're going to try and calculate the number of pixels in the quad here and we can do that based on the width that we've chosen so the total number of samples will be the width uh, in the OpenGL coordinate system multiplied by the display width in pixels but multiplied by 0.5 because the OpenGL coordinate system uh, the width of the screen is 2 so that's why we have to divide it by 2 uh, so that's now the width of the quad in pixels uh, so to get the total number of pixels we need to square it and if we're using multi-sampling then each pixel will actually have multiple samples and I am using multi-sampling here and each pixel has four samples so I need to multiply the number of pixels by four to get the total number of samples so now that we've calculated that total samples number we can put it in here and I'm also just going to min this to make sure that it never returns a number that's greater than one even if the total samples number turns out to be wrong uh, in that worst case scenario it will still never give a number more than one and I'm just going to print out this total samples number just to check that it's close to that number I expect it to be um, it will be slightly off because of rounding errors but that's close enough uh, so just make sure that it's close enough for you as well and that should all still be working fine so the final thing that we have to do is to make sure that this quad isn't actually shown on the screen because obviously we don't want it to be there and to do that we can just call gl color mask and put in false for all of the color components and this will stop any colors being rendered to the color buffer and we might as well do the same for the depth buffer so that it doesn't get written to the depth buffer either um, and of course we need to remember to undo this once we've finished doing the query so we just want to set these all back to true again otherwise anything rendered after this won't be rendered so let's go ahead and now run that and hopefully everything should be completely working now so you should be able to see the lens flare effect and when the sun goes behind a tree or a house that lens flare effect should not be visible so that is pretty much going to be it for this week thank you guys very much for watching this video do subscribe if you haven't already have a fantastic week and i will see you all next time